I want you to turn again in the Word of God with me to the Gospel according to Luke and to the 18th chapter, Luke's Gospel, chapter 18. And we're going to read there from verse 9 through to the end of verse 14. Luke's Gospel, chapter 18, and beginning to read at verse 9. Luke's Gospel, as you may know, has a large central section where everything happens around the journey that Jesus is taking to Jerusalem. He teaches in that long section a great deal about the gospel, about salvation, about the kingdom of God, and he encounters a number of different people and gives them spiritual direction. And in the course of his teaching, he also gives his disciples and those who hear him a number of parables. And this one, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, or perhaps in your Bible, the Pharisee and the publican, is the one we're going to read this evening. So let's hear God's word again. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. I read the other day in a publication that somewhere between 70% and 80% of Americans believe they are going to heaven. And as an alien resident in the United States, one of the things that often strikes me is how interested we are in our culture in heaven. Every so often, for example, somebody will claim to have an after-death experience and write about it, and characteristically, the publication sells well. Many of you will know a recent bestseller, even if you haven't read it or can't remember the title of it. You know it's got something to do with a young boy who went to heaven and came back with a detailed record of what he saw there. Almost one would have the impression if you wanted to write a bestseller, then you'd better somehow or another get to heaven but not stay there. Come back (laughs) and tell the rest of folks what it is really like. It's interesting, actually, that those people who go to heaven in dreams or in whatever experiences they have, never seem to describe the place in exactly the same way, which may cast some doubt on their credibility. But since so many of us believe in heaven, and almost as many believe that we are going to heaven, this particular story of the Lord Jesus, like a number of other stories he tells, should be of special interest to us. These parables that Jesus tells tend to fall into two categories. Some of them are what I would call just-so stories, where Jesus explains that this is how the kingdom of God works. There are other stories, and this is one of them, that fall into the category of Which man gets to heaven? Many of you have a special opportunity tonight because there are so many of us in the room this evening 
who are preachers. And this is one of your opportunities to say to preachers something that you've always wanted to say to them. And one of the things I find people always want to say to preachers is you should use more illustrations. We love illustrations. And we wish you were more like Jesus, because Jesus constantly used illustrations. And so, unlike you, that's the underlying theme, unlike you, Mr. Preacher, Jesus made things crystal clear. The only problem with that is that these parables are not actually illustrations like that. Earlier on in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus had told one of these parables and his disciples, the inner crowd, came to him and said, would you kindly explain this parable to us? And among other things, Jesus said to them, now you are being given the secret of the kingdom of God, and I am going to help you understand these parables, but one of the reasons I am explaining things in parables is partly so that people can hear and yet not hear and see and yet not really see. But I want to plant these time bombs into their mind so that they puzzle over what I've taught them. They may find what I've taught them strange or new or challenging or even irritating and upsetting. But only when God's Spirit works in them will they ever discover the secret. So parables are strange things. They are actually meant to illumine those who already believe. They're also meant to irritate those who don't yet believe. To be irritants, to get under the skin. And certainly for those who listened, and Luke makes this perfectly plain at the beginning of the parable, for those who listened, this was one of the parables that Jesus intended to get underneath people's skin. And it is a remarkable story, isn't it? It really is a story that encourages its original hearers, and as, as we read it, although we think we understand it better than they did, to ask the question, which of these two men should get to heaven? Should it be the Pharisee, or should it be the tax collector, or publican? And he paints a picture that uh, those who heard him would have been accustomed to. There were two daily services in the temple in Jerusalem, one in the early morning and the other known as the evening service that took place about three o'clock in the afternoon. It's probably that latter service that people would be thinking about as Jesus told this story. And he invites us, imagining that we are familiar with the structure of that temple, he invites us to see Two people coming up around about 2.45 in the afternoon and coming to this afternoon or evening service of sacrifice. Actually, they share a number of things in common externally. They come to the same church. And so they do have one thing in common. They have come to the same service. Probably the Pharisee was at the earlier service as well as the later service, but here they are at the same evening service. And also a very strange thing, both of them stand slightly apart from the rest of the congregation. You know, there are people like that for whatever reason. There are some people who are always at the end of a pew. There is a high level of claustrophobia in those who attend church, apparently. And then there are some people who always sit at the back. And there are a few people who always sit at the front. And here these men do exactly the same thing, but for totally different reasons that you would not know until you got to know them. The Pharisee kind of stands a bit apart, 
And this tax collector publican, he also seems to stand a little apart. And amazingly, during the service, they both engage in private acts of devotion. There was a point, actually, in the evening service when the people would be expected to engage in private devotion and private prayer. And at that point in the service, both these men do exactly the same thing. And here's a striking feature of these two men. The only word that comes out of their mouth that they have in common is the word God. So they are both addressing the same God. Similarities. But as Jesus begins to tell this story, it becomes clear, as actually is true in every church service, that similarities tend to mask differences. And you never really know what's going on in people's hearts and lives. I had an email yesterday from a fairly elderly lady in our congregation whose husband, all unknown to me, left her 45 years ago. And she emailed me to say that as a result of the sermon on Sunday morning, she had come to see that she had borne a resentment all those 45 years of which often she had been unconscious, but it was still lingering in her heart. I didn't know anything about that, nothing about the husband. I would never have guessed about the resentment. She is the sweetest, most enthusiastic elderly lady you could imagine to meet in a Christian church. And then you multiply that, multiply that simply by the number of us who are here this evening. So many similarities. And yet, underneath the similarities, behind the faces, such very different experiences. Even in the same room, singing about the same God and yet potentially doing so in dramatically different ways. And this whole story that Jesus tells underscores those dramatic differences between the Pharisee and the tax collector. And he invites us to have a look at them. Let's first of all take a look a little closer at the Pharisee. The question in our mind eventually has got to be, is this the man in the congregation who is going to go to heaven? Is this the man in the congregation who is going to go to heaven? You would recognize him, actually, by his dress. I flew into Newark Airport uh, this afternoon. I actually love flying out of Newark Airport if I've got a, if I've got a layover because it's such an interesting people-watcher position as the, as the whole of this massive conurbation of society passes through New York Airport. And uh, every time I'm there, I will see Jewish men and women, and especially the men, dressed in their distinctive garb. Hasidic Jews flying perhaps to Tel Aviv or going to Europe for some reason or another. And this man belonged to that tradition. He belonged to the tradition of Judaism that believed that one ought to honor God in very public and very manifest ways. He was conservative. He wasn't a liberal Sadducee who was shaky not only around the margins of Old Testament teaching, but shaky at the very center of Old Testament teaching. And he was marked by some remarkable characteristics, tremendous respect for the law of God, reading it day and night. I happened to travel a couple of years ago to Tel Aviv and watched a man literally do that all through the night. His finger was on Torah as he read through, meditating day and night. And this man was doubtless such a man, and a man of extraordinary devotion. You know, the Old Testament had called people to fast, to deprive themselves of food, food, 
on the Day of Atonement. But this man multiplied that amazingly, extraordinary discipline. He fasted twice a week, as many of his Pharisee companions did. And then he was wonderfully regular in his giving. He gave a tithe, a tenth of everything that he possessed. He says that. Of absolutely everything I get, I tithe. It's just an amazing phenomenon. You will pardon me because some of you will know I'm actually a Presbyterian minister. You'll pardon me for saying that in some senses the Pharisees were the original Presbyterians. After all, they had elders in the Old Testament and that's what Presbyterians do. And here was a man who, he was a classic Presbyterian if I can put it that way. Deeply committed to the, the deep-seated convictions of the most conservative people. And actually, come to think of it, speaking as a Presbyterian, if your church was full of this kind of Presbyterian, then the church budget would immediately double or perhaps treble or quadruple or quintuple. So we need to take this man really seriously. Because he takes himself really seriously. And he takes his religion really seriously. I mean, from one point of view, he is an absolutely prime candidate for membership in a Presbyterian church. So let's imagine in a Presbyterian church that some of the elders are interviewing him for membership. And they ask him quite searching questions. They don't just say to him, oh, you were in Second Presbyterian Church, uh, and uh, we are Second Presbyterian Church, so welcome, that's fine. Nobody, nobody worries too much about the really serious things. We take you at face value. No, you could imagine the elders saying to him, is your life different? Is your life different from the people around you? That's one of the hallmarks that we look for. And he could say to them, I thank God that my life is different from the lives of others? And is there, is, there any, is there any prevailing sin in your life? I thank God I've been, I've been kept all my life from open sin. And your, your attitude to others, that's a telling thing, isn't it? How do you respond to others? You know, as I was coming to church today, I saw, I saw a tax collector there. Do you know what my first thought was? My first thought was there, but for the grace of God go I. And I thank God that I wasn't like him. And other things, spiritual disciplines, I, I, yes, I, I, I've sought to fast twice a week. And, and then when it comes to the sensitive question, they're so excited by this man that they don't usually ask the sensitive question. And what about giving to the church? Will you give to the church? I tithe everything to the church. Not a bad list of qualifications, you would think. Fast track to membership. And you could understand it. I mean, there's something quite, there's something almost awesome about this man's religious life. So could be this the man who's going to go to heaven? Well, let's leave him for a moment and turn secondly to the tax collector. I noticed one of our uh, Republican, I shouldn't say our Republican, but uh, our Republican candidates is speaking about taxes. So it's, it's in the news. And it's an honorable thing to be a tax collector in the United States of America. Even to collect taxation from those of us who don't have representation. It is an honorable, honorable profession. And the taxman is also something of a, of a joke, isn't he? You know, because of that strange sense of, I really should resent this man, but I don't resent this man because he's actually only doing his duty to the government. And that makes it so hard for us to, to feel the atmosphere, that, uh, the aura that surrounds this particular man. Perhaps I can try this to just get us into the atmosphere, because there's atmosphere here. 
I guess most of us here this evening, if we use MasterCard or Visa, we, uh, we try to pay the bill off at the end of the month, don't we? That's a sensible way to live. They call it a credit card, but it's actually a debit card, isn't it? You don't get any credit from a credit card. All you get is debt, and so you want to pay it off. But I wonder if ever, like me, somehow or another you've forgotten to do it, and then the bill has come in the next month, and you think, how could I possibly have spent so much last month? And then you realize that's actually the charges, That's the penalties and the interest. I mean, how is it that your bank pays you? What does it pay you in interest? Almost nothing. And MasterCard can charge you 18%, 22% interest. Now, I don't care how much you would prefer the whole of the United States to be run on a private enterprise basis and big government to get out of everything. I can't imagine there's anyone in the room, unless you've shares in MasterCard, who would ever want MasterCard to be running the tax system. (laughs) But you imagine that MasterCard, and I'm grateful for my MasterCard, Don't get me wrong, I'm grateful for the facility it gives to me not to have to carry money around all the time. I'm grateful for that. But you imagine that you you discovered that MasterCard was piling on these excessive penalties and interest rates, and then it appeared in the New York Times that MasterCard was actually owned by China. Well, that's what's going on here. This is not our IRS employee. This is an employee of the Roman government whose entire livelihood depends upon him charging extra taxes than even the Roman government is asking for. He is a tax farmer. And he is also, in the deepest sense, a traitor. This is a man who will be mentioned by the Jewish people in the same breath as prostitutes, tax collectors, and sinners. That's what sinners means, prostitutes. Because he's a traitor. And he's growing fat on being a traitor. And it's very evident here because he's in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the place where the Fortune 500 tax collectors lived. Because there they could enjoy the best of life, the finest facilities, and they could afford them. Enormously wealthy. But gaining that wealth by betraying And by despoiling his fellow men and women. And there he is. He's, can you believe it? Can you believe it? He's actually going to church. And he's probably not sure why. I mean, why would he go to church? And there he goes, and and you can see them, you know, if you were in a if you were in a news helicopter, you know, looking down, you could see them both coming from from their different parts of Jerusalem towards the temple. And uh, there he is. He's not even sure why he's there. And one thing is obvious. He, he, He has no idea what's going on in the service. He doesn't know how to behave. He actually behaves in a manner that is unspeakably out of place. Ancient Near Eastern women beat their chest, not except in the most excessive circumstances, ancient Near Eastern men. So he is altogether out of place. And so, which one gets to heaven? Well, let me take up Jesus' question. 
Let me give you six reasons why it couldn't be the tax collector. First, he's an extortioner, and extortioners are not fit for heaven. Second, he's unjust, and he's taken more than was righteous. And you notice where I get this from. I get this from the, 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 the pious prayer of the Pharisee. He, he, he puts this very, one might almost say gently, but I think there's no doubt what he means when he says, I'm not like other men. I thank God that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Now, what made him think of the tax collector? It is that the tax collector is almost certainly all three of these things. He's an extortioner. He's unjust. And sadly, like many rich men, he can afford to be an adulterer. And he can't look God in the face. Look at how he comes in. It's, a, it's really a disgrace. It wouldn't be a disgrace so much uh, I suppose, in the modern 21st century, but for a man to come into the temple and not even lift up his eyes to heaven. And this is probably the first time he's been in the temple in many years. And that's why when it comes to this point in the liturgy for private prayer, he doesn't know the words that he's supposed to use. So it certainly looks as though it's not this man who will get to heaven. But then, if there are six reasons why it shouldn't be the tax collector, I'll give you six reasons why it almost certainly would be the Pharisee. The first is because he's a man of prayer. And he knows how to pray. He doesn't find it hard. The other man doesn't know what to say, but he finds it easy. Isn't that a real mark of spirituality, incidentally? That you no longer find prayer difficult, but, but find it easy? Is that a mark of spirituality? And here's the striking thing. He really thanks God for how he is. He really is a there but for the grace of God kind of individual. I thank God, he says, for what I have and for what I do. And thirdly, he's certainly living a changed life, indeed a disciplined life. And fourthly, he's different from other people. And that's what we really want, don't we? When you think about you think about the situation of the church in the United States of America, and one of the things, if you're a serious Christian, you lament is that Christians aren't different, that the, the, the statistics tell us that Christians aren't really different from non-Christians in so many instances. Reason number five is he's actually living a much better life than the tax collector is. There's no doubt about that. Absolutely no doubt about that. But there's a sixth reason, and maybe this is the clinching reason, why it might very well be the Pharisee. It's this. Because he's far more like me than the tax collector is. Isn't he? He's far more like me than the tax collector. And isn't it instinctive in most of us to understand that it is actually people like me who will get to heaven? People like this Pharisee, we are the people who will get to heaven. Because we too have seen people like this tax collector or people in different kinds of uh, distress or wasting their lives or even perhaps suffering. And the first words that have come into our heads have been, there but for the grace of God go I. 
So why does Jesus say it's the tax collector who goes to heaven and not the Pharisee? There's something in this parable that we are almost certainly bound to miss when we come to read it for the first time, maybe even for the tenth time. Something that the first hearers would never have missed because, of course, they had been there. They had seen the temple. They had been at the evening service. They knew what happened, and therefore they had an advantage over us. We can't envisage what's happening here, but they knew exactly what was happening here, and they knew exactly at what point in the service it was happening. Some time ago I was asked by a mutual friend to conduct a service with another friend. This was in a Presbyterian church, and I was a Presbyterian minister, but my friend was a Baptist minister. And we were standing there. This man is an accomplished preacher, tremendously able individual. But he was like a cat on a hot tin roof because he didn't know what was going to happen. Will you get me through this? When do I do this? And where do I do it from? Um, It's a very natural thing, isn't it? Um, And we don't have that sense. So let me just push the pause button on uh, Jesus' parable for a minute and, and explain to you what is actually happening here in the temple just at this point. What has just happened is that a lamb has been already selected for sacrifice. And that lamb has been washed and inspected to see that it is a lamb without blemish and therefore worthy to be sacrificed to God for the sins of the people. And then, having been inspected and washed in this way, the lamb has been taken to a sacrificial altar and it has been bound upon that altar with its face facing west. And then, with extraordinary expertise, the lamb has been slain and the blood has come out from the lamb and been carefully gathered And then, according to the ancient ritual, that lamb's sacrificial blood has been sprinkled as a symbol of the need for sacrifice to be appropriated if it is to be realized. And then the lamb has been flayed and carried up and offered on a burnt offering altar. And with all other little elements of liturgy, the people have stood in silence and awe at this amazing scene. I don't suppose there are many in this room, if any in this room, who have ever actually witnessed an animal sacrifice. They're just the sheer realism of it all. And there they are holding up their hands. The symbolism is obvious, isn't it? They're saying, oh God, in heaven, this sacrifice is made to you. And it was at that point that then individuals in the congregation who had come for the evening sacrificial offering would be able to make their private devotions. And that's what's happening when we enter the parable They are engaging in their private devotions. And that's the key. The key is what comes out of their mouths. The interesting thing is that the Pharisee says everything he has, he has by grace from God. I thank you. But actually nothing he has, he has by grace from God. Do you notice just the sound of his sentences? I, 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 I. And the character of the very verbs he uses, they're all active verbs. 
I mean, actually, it's amazing. It's an amazing contrast with what he has just witnessed. He has just witnessed an animal being sacrificed, and there he is talking to God about himself and his accomplishments. He's missed the whole point of the thing. There's no need for mercy. There's no need for forgiveness. There's no cry for a savior. He actually has a religion in which he doesn't really need salvation because God has helped him to accomplish everything that is needed for him to be able to save himself. And so he never asks to be forgiven. He never asks to be justified. He never asks for God's grace to cover all his sins because he actually can't see his sins even when he's speaking about them. An actual confession of sin is pouring out of his mouth, but he's not admitting his sin to God. And so this whole thing could have happened in the temple, and it would have made no difference whatsoever to the way in which he prayed. But there is the tax collector. Think again about the moment in which he is praying. The chosen lamb has been washed and inspected and tied upon the altar and slain and its blood taken and sprinkled. And he comes to God in private devotion and he beats his chest in response to what he has just seen and says, O God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Actually, what he says is much more telling than that. He doesn't speak about himself as a sinner. He says, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. You see, he's not looking round to see whether he's better or worse than anyone else. He's not raising himself up above somebody else in the congregation. He's not saying to God, oh God, at least I'm not quite as bad as he is, so I'm okay, aren't I? He's beating his chest and he's saying, ah, it is so I am the only sinner in the world as I, as I come to you. Oh God, he says, be merciful to me, the sinner. Now, Luke, who wrote this gospel, must have been an immensely able man. Immensely able. Because only a few verses further on, you remember in the famous story of Jesus going to Jericho, as he does perhaps in a day or no more than two days from the day in which he told this parable. And uh, there's a blind man in Jericho called Bartimaeus. Do you remember how he cries out to Jesus? Remember what he cries out to Jesus? Jesus, son of David, he says, have mercy on me. What's not so obvious in the text is that Bartimaeus uses a completely different word from the word that the tax collector is using here in the parable. What Bartimaeus is asking Jesus for is that he would have mercy on his terrible affliction of blindness. But the word that's used here in this parable by Luke, and incidentally he's the only gospel writer who tells of this parable, the word that's used is not just God be merciful to me in my weakness. The verb he uses means, O oh God, be propitiated. Be propitiated. Now, that's an unusual verb to us, but it does appear in the New Testament a number of times. Propitiation. Propitiation means God's wrath being satisfied by being poured out either symbolically or really upon a sacrifice that is brought to him. That was the whole point of this mammoth drama that took place in the temple every afternoon. It was a reminder on the one hand that none of us is able to bear our own sins before God and live, and on the other hand 
that God was providing a means by which visibly his wrath and judgment might be outpoured upon a perfect spotless lamb as a as a vision picture as a as a hint that there is forgiveness with God that he may be feared and that outpouring of God's wrath had this glorious effect that if the wrath of God was poured out upon a substitute then by that very fact the offerer of the sacrifice could be set free from the fear of God's judgment the fear of God's wrath could sense that there was forgiveness with God that that God would be feared that you would want to to be in awe of such a God you want to love such a God and live for such a God and the great thing would be that if your sins that had brought down from heaven God's wrath, if those sins were forgiven in God's outpouring of his wrath on your substitute, then your conscience would be free at last from days, months, years of rising up and condemning you for your sin and your memory bringing back into your mind's vision or into your latent memory banks memories of all the ways in which your life has failed God and failed others. And I wonder if it's stretching a point to say that since this man was a tax collector and therefore used to doing very careful calculations, he would have understood that this lamb that had just been sacrificed was by no means an adequate sacrifice to take away his sins. How could one little lamb possibly atone for the sins of this man knowing his sins. And so he cries out, O oh God, be propitiated to me, the sinner. It's daring, isn't it? I mean, he's really saying, O oh God, there's a, there's, a, there's, a kind of, there's a kind of God-given boldness in this, isn't there? It's as though he's saying, O oh God, if I'm the only sinner in all the world... And standing here, I feel as if I am the greatest sinner, the sinner. Oh, God, find a way of being propitious to me. Now, all this seems, doesn't it, like an isolated story. But it's not an isolated story in Luke's gospel. That's why I said he seems to be such a brilliant writer. Because within two weeks of our Lord Jesus telling this story at exactly the same time in the afternoon at the time of the evening sacrifice as one who three years before had been pointed out by John the Baptist in these words behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and then having been washed and then having been examined, Luke will tell us in a few chapters that in the last hours of Jesus' life, he was examined and examined and re-examined and re-examined. And it's startling in Luke's gospel that every time Jesus is examined, he is condemned. And yet every time he's examined, and there are five or six occasions in one chapter, every single time he's declared to be absolutely innocent. And at three o'clock in the afternoon as he was bound to the altar of Calvary, he cried out as a sacrifice of propitiation, My God, my God, I am forsaken. Why? And you see, within the parable, this man has no idea how much he's asking for. But the Lamb of God, who is himself telling the parable, is going to take away 
even a tax collector's sins. So that Jesus might say of him, this man left the temple justified. You understand what that means? That means that God himself was paying his debt. God himself was experiencing his judgment. And God himself would pardon all his sins and he would be able to come into God's presence. He'd be able to go back to the temple again and say to God, Oh God, what mercy you have shown me. He would be able to sing, My Jesus, I love you. I know you are mine. For you, all the pleasures of sin I resign. Now, how do I know that he would sing that? Because Luke tells me that within a week of Jesus telling this parable, he doesn't say this in so many words, but it's, it's clearly written here into the story that word had got out. Did you hear what Jesus said? We knew Jesus spent time with tax collectors and sinners. But did you hear what he said? He said about this Pharisee that this Pharisee would never get to heaven. He would never be justified. And he said about a tax collector who beat his breast and said, God be merciful to me, the sinner. He said, that's the man who's going to go to heaven. Did you hear that? And as Jesus moved on a few days, he came to the city of Jericho. And as he walked through the city of Jericho, great crowds following him, no wonder. And he stopped and he looked up into a sycamore tree. Do you know what he saw in the sycamore tree? A tax collector. His name was Zacchaeus. He wasn't any ordinary tax collector. He was a Fortune 500 plus tax collector. He was a chief tax collector and a very rich man. And I have a suspicion he had no idea how he got up that tree. He had no idea what was going on in his heart and mind. The only thing he knew was he wanted to see this Jesus. This Jesus who had spoken about a way for tax collectors to get to heaven. And somehow or another, as uh, that had scraped under the layers that he had built up on his life, the end of the day, you know, the end of the day, my friend, you can be Steve Jobs, worth endless billions. You can even, as I heard him say in an interview, look into the mirror and say, if this is the last day I'm going to live, Will I live it the way I intend to live it? You can all that. I flew over a graveyard this afternoon and I thought that's the space we end up taking. We can build huge industries. We can have massive houses. We can have all the technology in the world. And this is all it adds up to. If you don't have Christ... And here was this man. And uh, the amazing thing in the story, he must have almost fallen out of the tree. Zacchaeus, he said. I wonder if you've ever met one of those wonderful Christian people. You're You're nobody. I've met a number of wonderful Christian men. And I'm nobody to them. But when they've come up to me, they've shook my hand and said, Sinclair, it's so good to meet you. And I thought, how on earth did you know my name? Do you know how he knew it? I don't know how he knew it. But do you think he maybe said, when we go through Jericho, somebody tell me the name of the chief tax collector there. And he sees this man. Who else would be climbing a tree? He said, Zacchaeus, He saw right into him. You see, everybody else saw a tax collector. But Jesus saw right into the man's soul. And he said, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house. 
And as they talked together, that man found precisely what the tax collector in the temple in the parable had found parabolically. Zacchaeus found, really. You see, it's not just a story. And Jesus says to him before he goes, he says, before I go, Zacchaeus, there's one thing I need to say to you. He says, Zacchaeus, I said, I want to give it all back, Lord. I want to give it all back. I want to repent. And Jesus says, today, salvation has come to this house. So, which of these two men went to heaven. You see, this whole story Jesus tells is also meant to ask another question. And the other question is this. So, my friend, are you the Pharisee? Or are you the tax collector? Church member? Church officer? Lifetime of service. Frequently saying, there but for the grace of God, go I. But actually believing that you've largely done it yourself. You would never deny that God has given you some help. But you've really done it yourself. And so the idea of needing a sacrifice, needing forgiveness... It's actually, it's no, part of, it's no part of how you think about church or religion or Christianity. It's actually no part of how you even think about Jesus. Or is there a heart cry that says, God be merciful to me, the sinner. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress. Helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Saviour, or I die. So which man got to heaven? Or to put Jesus' point far more clearly... And perhaps you're here tonight and you've no idea why you're here. I mean, there are trivial reasons why you're here. But you're here because Jesus has brought you here. Because this is what he wants to say to you. And I've no idea who you are. You look like everybody else. But you're actually different from everybody else. As far as you know. Because in this meeting, this very night, in this place, you've actually forgotten there's a Scottish accent at all. And what you're hearing is another accent of Jesus saying to you, now which of these two men are you? Are you going to heaven? Have you said to me, Jesus, be merciful to me, the sinner? And as he said to you, I'm going to live with you and change your life, and you've said, Lord, everything, change everything. I am yours. Well, that's the gospel in a parable, isn't it? But it's the gospel in your heart, your life, Christ. Propitiation for your sin. What? A saviour. And what a thing to know that he saved you. Oh, I want to say to you, don't leave this place tonight not knowing whether you're his. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, how marvellous our Lord Jesus is. How, how wonderfully he speaks, how clearly he knows our hearts, how powerful and illuminating his word is. But oh, his presence when he comes 
with his word and when he speaks his word right into our hearts and we are conscious that he is speaking to us and that he is preaching to us and that he is calling us and that he has been pursuing us when we never recognized his presence and he has brought us here and we thought we had come here because of reasons of our own. And he's spoken to us. Lord Jesus, Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy upon me and give me your peace. And this we pray for your name's sake. Amen.